Hello, everyone. Welcome to instructor presentations. All of us are here. Um, we're going to do a warm up joke to start. Um, so a guy walks into a bar, right? And he's immediately disqualified from the limbo contest. Wow. <laughs> a couple. Wow. All right. Anyway, we'll just brush over that. Um, because it was a limbo contest. Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, wow. We'll spend, we'll spend my 10 minutes will be dissecting this joke and then we'll move on to our first instructor. Um, okay. So it's Friday night instructor presentations. Um, we are going to have two of our instructors um, take turns giving 10 minute presentations about their work and themselves. Um, it's actually a really fun night, and I'm glad everyone's here, both here and we've got some people on Zoom here. Um, I think we should just go ahead and get going. Um, we're going to start in the fiber department with Gasali Adiemo. Did I say that right? Close enough. Great. Thank you. Um, and y'all are doing some indigo dyeing up there. It looks like it's going to be a really fun night. And Carl Johnson is going to introduce you. Thank you. Uh, Gasali Adiembo was uh, born in this small, in a small rural village um, located in Nigeria. From a very young age, he realized his artistic potential. And in 1990, he discovered the Nike Center for Arts and Culture, where he remained for six years. In 96, he then moved to the United States. And now based in Santa Fe, New Mexico, he travels the world conducting workshops and exhibitions, including at the World Batik Conference, Cross Culture Collaborative Incorporated, Snow Farm, and the Fiber Arts Center. So please join me in welcoming Gasali. Uh, good evening, everybody. I hope you can hear me very well. But before I begin tonight, I'd like to say it in my traditional language. Can you guys say ekale? Ekale. Ekale means good evening in my culture. Thank you for your beautiful introduction. But I might need to change my, my writing up of my website one day when it come. So my name is Gasali. I like to let people know because when I teach in public school, I always tell the kid that, what is your name mean? They say, I don't know. I say, wow, your name means something. Gasali is part of Arabic name. I grew up as a Muslim, but it's also traditional name means king before king. My last name means the crown fit me very well. People say, oh, you're from king family. I say, they don't make me a king yet. Maybe it's gonna happen in the future. So it's good to be here in Peter's Valley. I'm glad he's very happy in person, not the Zoom class anymore right now. We hope for the best. I'm an indigo dyer. I follow my beautiful mom, Step, when I was a young kid. And I like to show this a little bit because a lot of people say, oh, Nigeria is a big country. And I let a lot of people know Africa is a huge country. I mean, continent, of course. And when I came to Peter's Valley, I feel like, wow, this is my home because it's very slushy and it's rain every day. But move to Santa Fe, it's a different story. <laughs> it's so brown. So I'm a Yoruba. I grew up in the Yoruba culture and which is, Language I speak is called Yoruba, and then the name of my tribe is Yoruba. I'm glad I can remove my mask. I always show my students when they look my face, there's a little mark, like a tattoo. It's part of my tribal mark to identify what part of tribe I came from in Nigeria. This is the beautiful woman right here. This is my mother. She's my first teacher. I like to proud of her because I follow her footprint to preserve the tradition I was doing today. 
all over the global. She's my teacher. And also I go to another school in Nigeria for 10 years to study about the fiber arts. And she told me, but it's happened accidentally last year, she passed away due to COVID. As soon as I left Nigeria, they called me, she's gone. But I was very lucky that day when I spoke to her before she left her. So that is my beautiful mother. I was followed as full sprint. And I like to show my life how things is beginning because people say, oh, we saw your name everywhere. Wow, you're so famous. But I say it doesn't happen overnight. But my message to a lot of young people, even both United States and Africa, anything you do in life, if you love it, you have a passion for it, stick with it. It won't happen overnight. But that is my father always tell me when I was a young kid. And I was just really happy to be able to, to preserve the tradition. And that is why I've been going all over the global. If we, the same thing, public school in San Rafael, in Mexico, with the young children, to let them know how the tradition was so important. This is, we just celebrate this beautiful shrine. As I say, you see, it looked like a lot of uh, swamp. This is Osun River in Nigeria. The statue you see right here is what we worship every August of the month. It just happened like a couple weeks ago or last week actually. This is how the indigo was beginning. Because people say, oh, how do you identify the indigo in your country? And this is the place indigo was coming out in the history from seven generations of my tribe. This is the fresh plant before my students saw it in my class today, before it become a dry ball. That is how we collect the fresh indigo before we, we die with it. You can see indigo is a color of medicine, is a color of love, which is have a lot of long history behind how it's so important and what is the impact indigo have in my community where I grew up in Nigeria. And we paint the houses for the indigo. And you can see, we're gonna see the same thing in my class this week. I'm gonna start soaking the beautiful plant in the dye vat. My students saw all the wood ash from the cocoa ash. We're gonna do the fermentation and we're gonna be able to do the dye first starting from the, probably by the Sunday afternoon, we're gonna see the blue color was glowing in the pot. And the dye vat continue. There's nothing go waste in the dye vat in my country. People visit my studio in Santa Fe. I have like five days kind of this 15 gallon pots like that. It's a recycle processing. And even when you finish the dye, the weak vat in my country, it was a medicine. Nothing go waste. The stamp you see in my hand in the slide screen right now, we use it as an insert to clear a lot of bad energy. But the liquid from indigo, when somebody hits something like a, I don't like to say it in English, like poison, any healing man you go to his house in Africa, they have those leftover indigo vat. We call it osuku, the leftover of indigo. When you drink it, it settles your stomach. That is why the plant was so have so many impact in my culture. It's our identification. We wear indigo. That is why when I show up this morning in Peter's Valley, people say, wow, look at you. Because when I came to United States, I don't know you have to carry identification. When I came here, this is my identity. Anybody saw me back in the day before the September, se se September 11, I used to travel like this at the airport. People say, oh, when you came? How long you been here? But I live in Santa Fe because people know me through my country. They say, oh, you're from Southwest of Nigeria, you Yoruba, because of my dress code we use in my country. And also I like to share my image of my work. This is batik technique. Actually, we're gonna begin with this tomorrow also. He saw hand painting and I was talk, talk through it of this with my student today 
all those designs you see on the piece is a part of life we live in him. It's our identity, it's our symbol, it's a message we use in the community. And this is the tools. This is me back in 90s, 1992, back home in Nigeria, which is, I was on the road, but I don't know where I'm going, but I believe what I was doing and I have a lot of passion with it. And that is why I'm here today. And also I was telling my student today, we have to wait till tomorrow, of course, batik is my therapy. I use batik to express my feelings, to pour so many things I don't want in my life. Even this has saved me due to COVID in last year. When I walk in my studio, sometimes my son say, are you okay? Why are you smiling by yourself? I say, I'm not crazy, son. I know what I'm doing. So Batik take you to different level. Like you sit by yourself, but your mind travel to set you back, you know, so many level, like you just want to be. And this is what we walk into through today at the end of the class. This is Adire. Cassava is a very highly food in my country. It's called tapioca. We call it yoka plant. But also in my country, instead of using the rice paste, we use cassava as a resist. A lot of students saw it today. They said, oh my God, it doesn't resist in the back. When we wait by this week, when we remove it, people say, what is okay means? It means it's all good. And you see the circle right here? That means the record, the turntable we play in the, it's not seen in the olden days. You can still see them in Target or Walmart or Best Buy. So basically a lot of design we use is part of the daily life we live in here and to preserve the tradition. What has been using before I was born as a young kid. And I was wearing this, the same stencil technique. Also, we call it mosquito coil. And I can feel a lot of mosquito here when I came. So the coil will light to chase mosquitoes mosquito away. Also, we call it record. And they all die with beautiful Yoruba indigo. I like to show this. We're gonna see this in our documentary tomorrow. This is my sister. This is how long the food processing take in my culture. The cassava itself, we have to soak it for five days. When they soft, we break them into pieces and then we dry them in the... That is why I choose Sarana Fe because there's a lot of beautiful mountain, but we don't have a stone mountain in Sarana Fe, but we did have a lot in where I grew up in Nigeria. And I was talking about this piece. This is my favorite piece, actually. I love all my work. This is, oh, not this one. Sorry, I thought I was saying this. this is what I was using in the class, how to apply the piece with the chicken feather. You can see the cassava. You need to take two, three days to dry before, before we dye it. And this is my design. I really, really, it put me back when I was a young kid because I spent a lot of my time with my grandparents. I always ask students, how many of you have a grandparent? I was so jealous because when I came here, you don't see the street light in my village. It's a full moon. That is how the design was come up in the history of Africa. Moon and a lot of stars. That is what the tie-dye was represent the meaning. You can see, I was showing this piece I'm going to introduce this in the class too. That's another tie dye technique with the string to create the circle of life. Also, we call it filler, alakete. And my beautiful tie dye also called pigeon eyes. You can see people say, oh, I do tie dye, but I use a rubber band. But I cheat as a young kid to use a grass, which is called raffia here, to tie with because they resist very well and they form a lot of the design. And I have a lot of slides because of time they give it to me. I use indigo, 
it unites the world. Indigo brings us together. I can feel it already in my class because two of my students, they just took me to dinner tonight. I was so happy. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Kasali. Um, next up in the Wood Studio, which I've heard great things about, is Ellen Caspern. And we will have Kat Nash introducing. Hey guys, um, I'm Kat Nash, the Wood Assistant, and I'm here to introduce Ellen Caspern. Ellen is a custom furniture maker and graduate of the North Bennett Street School Cabinet and Furniture Making Program. She owns Ellen Caspern Design and is a member of the Charles Charleston Furniture Makers. In addition to designing and making furniture, she has been teaching woodworking for over 15 years. This is her third time teaching here at Pierce Valley. She has also written articles for Fine Woodworking Magazine and her lessons are featured in instructional videos for their website. Please join me in welcoming Ellen Casper. Everyone. Um, <clears throat> so I do, I mostly teach. I do a few commissions a year, but this is me teaching um, at the school that I graduated from, the North Bennett Street School. And I'm gonna start at the beginning. Um, so I went to the school. It's actually the oldest trade school in the US. It's in Boston, Massachusetts. And when you're there as a student, you have to um, finish three pieces. You have to make a table, a chair, and a case piece. And it's they train you in 17th and 18th century furniture. So I just kind of want to show kind of where I started. So this was my table. And these are the my chest, my, my case piece are these um, frame and panel chests and then um, Chippendale side chair. And I had extra time as a student and I made this Hepple White bow front chest of drawers. So it's very, it's very traditional um, woodworking. And it's, that's kind of what I, what I do now. Um, so this bookcase on, the, on your right, um, actually, the, I'm just gonna say the glass bookcase um, with glass doors is mahogany. And then the cabinet on the on the other side is what I did two years ago um, at Peters Valley. We made this um, wall cabinet just so students can learn kind of how to make a kitchen cabinet. And so that was really fun. Um, Built-ins I made for a client and these people were really awesome because they had contacted me. I didn't know them through my website and I was like, nah, I don't have time. You know, I'm teaching a lot. And they were like, we have a five-year-old daughter and only men are coming to give estimates will you come and I was like okay sold so I went and did it and um this was to replace uh they had a railing in their house a split level house and this was to replace the railing um so that was fun and then I make mostly I make a lot of tables so tables are what I probably make the most of and the ash table um the light colored table is the ash table and that's nine feet long about 42 inches wide um that went to a client in a three-story walk up in the city, <laughs> that was fun. And then another walnut table, um, a hall side table, kind of has a sunburst veneer pattern on the top. It's hard to see, um, then just some more tables. This is kind of like a take on a shaker table, actually reproduce this. I saw it in a magazine and I just liked it. Um, th that was early on in my career. So these are not in any order of when I made them. And then, I mostly teach and so I teach a shaker table class and I've probably taught it about five times and I have never made a shaker table and I was just like oh I was having like this imposter syndrome so finally in my last class I made one and then a lot of times as Kat knows I gave a lot of parts out and so I had extra parts so I got to make two tables so <laughs> from the class um, just another class that I taught this is all classes that I taught um, just I do a lot of prototyping so and I call these my scrappy tables because just kind of scraps from my shop I made them and then I don't dye a lot of I don't stain a lot of wood but I did dye the tops on the two tables and then the black anything that you see dyed black in my work is actually dyed with shoe leather polish um, kind of what my mentor did and then these are little, very small tables. They're just for single glass. And they're kind of, and these are more of my designs, things that I just thought of. And then these tables, I have gone to Penland School of Craft for three winter residencies. And we always do table in a day. So that little oak table was what I did in 2020, right before the pandemic hit, I was there, made that table. And then the table with the, 
um, that's red, that's actually dyed poplar, it's veneer. Um, and that I did my first residency there, that was the table that I made there. And then every year that I'm there, I also like to just have some fun. And my dad worked a lot with Formica and I like to do a lot of inlaying. So I made these little bud bases and I'll do kind of different colors each year. So I think this is what I did in 2019. And then in 2020, I kind of did like some jewel tones. And so that's really fun to do. And then just a mitered box. So you make the whole box and then you cut it apart. And then I edged the, um, the banding, the edging is also for mica as well. And then I was making a bunch of these mitered boxes and I didn't want to cut them apart. And so I took the Formica and made a plug and it's actually a coin box. So you can put a coin in and slide it over and then you can actually, to take the coins out, you can pull the plug out. And then this mitered box um, for my great nephew, um, it was a play on his name. So I call it the, the, the O box, his name is Theo. And so there's O's on each side for Micah again inlaid, again, a coin box for him. And then this is what I had in making making matters this year at Peters Valley. Um, the it's a, I had these dressing mirrors. I did both of these at, at Penland in a winter, in a winter residency. Um, and what I did here was it's hard to see in the one that has the the blue dot the the back that's blue. But I take um, solid wood and then dyed veneer and I make my own plywood and I laminate it. And then um, the base actually is. Um, the waste from inside cutting out the circle when I cut out the circle. So those are dressing mirrors and the walnut one actually is walnut and blue. It's just really hard to see the blue with the walnut. And then I was asked to be part of an exhibit at the Fruitlands Museum in Harvard, Massachusetts. And there was 13 people that were invited and we were all asked to make a piece inspired by the piece. And I chose this twig table as my inspiration and it came from a camp in the 1930s. And I was thinking what goes with a table, you know, a chair, I didn't wanna make a chair. So I decided to make lanterns and the twigs are um, the latch of the door is a twig. The actually on this lantern, the candle slides out on a dovetail slide and the twig on the bottom is actually to pull the slide out, but it's also to stop the door from going in further. Um, mahogany actually made two lanterns. So also I chose the lantern because it was also um, in part with the school that I graduated from and their symbols of lantern. So, and then the other one, the other one the, is pear wood. The twigs are pear wood and they came from my parents' house and the pear tree fell down during Hurricane Sandy, so. Those were really fun. And then I bent my own. I don't know anything really about metal, but my dad um, did aluminum siding. So I knew about making a break and I made my own like shot made break with some plywood and hinges and bent all the copper for it um, myself. And then after that exhibit, the museum asked me to, and again, because I was trained in like 17th and 18th um, century furniture making, they um, commissioned me to make these um, chair finials for the museum. And they wanted them to be so that people could come up and touch them. And uh, this would be on the end of a chair. And so they had, um, they gave me a paper with 10 finials from different Shaker villages and I turned them and replicated them. And so you can see my notes on the piece of paper of what I did. So that was really fun. And again, um, in 2019, I was asked by the Boston Athenaeum to make what is called a book press. And you can see the original um, book press is from, that one is from 1710. And they, the Boston Athenaeum was having a show about um, books that came over from England to um, a church in Boston. And at the last minute, they decided that they wanted this book press in the show. And this is how the books would have traveled from England to the United States um, in this book press. And so I was given four weeks to make this, reproduce, um, replicate it and have it painted. I painted it, but then someone did the calligraphy and the museum, and not the museum, the library now uses it as a free library for children's books. So you could go and put a book in 
for free and take a and take a book out. So that was that was really fun. It's oak. Oops. There's the inside of it. So the inside was not not painted, um, but um, someone made the handles on the outside. I knew a, a woman that from Penland, and she made the handles on the outside of the case, and that was really cool. And then this I made for myself. It's a pie safe and walnut. I punched the tin. Um, my uh, one of my mentors and very good friend who passed away last year, he actually turned the knobs and made the latch, and they're out of ebony. But the back of this case is um, walnut that I took a board and I resold it in half, so I got book match images of it. And originally those were going to be on the sides of the case, but I didn't really care for them on the sides, and they were wide enough to be the back. And you'll never see it, but. And as I said, when I was a student, I had to make a chair and I had decided, yes. <laughs> None. <laughs> um, I said I had to make a chair as a student because they're one of the hardest things to make. And I vowed I would never make another chair. And then um, I was always intrigued by these chairs called the Brett stool. And researching them, they're a knockdown chair. The legs are tapered octagons. Um, the back slides all the way through the battens, which are dovetailed in. And I, when I was researching it, I realized they're also called a Moravian chair and a Moravian. And my hometown was settled by the Moravians. So I thought it was really cool that I was always drawn to these chairs. And then each back is like the person that makes it their own design. And I designed it to have the circles because I wanted to play off of, I like, I like shapes. I wanted to play off of the octagon legs. Um, and then I made two more. Um, that's what I made last year. And well, in, in 2020 at Penland, I made two more. And the wood from for these chairs was air dried walnut. And a student um, from my 2019 class at Peters Valley, Don, he had given me the wood. And one of the highlights is my dad. I said he made furniture and he always got fine woodworking magazine. and. I've written some articles and have done some videos. And so just kind of me there at Vine Woodworking, tuning up the bandsaw. I like machines. I also tune up a lot of machines. So I'll go to people's houses and tune up machines, go to different schools and tune up machines. Um, that's always really fun for me. And that's the end. So thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in. We would like to thank our sponsors for making programs like this possible. If you liked this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel to receive more like it in the future.